Hello, so this is the introductory video for the third practice sheet and the third mini test. Uh, this week we're going to be looking at another application of differentiation. This is the final week looking at differentiation. Next week we're going to start on a new topic. Um, so this week the thing we're going to look at is something called Taylor series. You may have heard of them before in one of your other classes. So a Taylor series gives you a way to approximate a function by a, a polynomial. If you approximate any given function around a particular point by saying it's approximately equal to a polynomial in x around that point. Okay. So in this first video I'm just going to explain exactly how you do that. So how do you approximate a function by a polynomial? And in some cases if you let the order of the polynomial go to infinity, so you let um, higher and higher powers of x in the polynomial, then the approximation can become exact. And in that case, what you have is called a Taylor series. Right, so I'm going to explain all of these concepts in this first video. So I want to start by motivating Taylor series. And I'm going to do this by talking about the tangent line, which we introduced last time. So remember, if you've got a function f of x and some point a on the function here, you can define the tangent line to f of x at the point a as the straight line which just touches the function at the point. So here it will look something like this. Okay, so this is the tangent line and we denoted it by ta of x like this and last time we found a formula for it. So the tangent line ta of x is given by the formula ta of x is f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. And you can note some important properties of the tangent line. The first thing is the value of the tangent line is equal to the value of the function at a. So in other words, ta of a is f of a. And the first derivatives are also equal. So ta primed at a is equal to f prime of a. So these can easily be checked from this formula. And the final thing to note about the tangent line is it, it's a straight line. So this means it's a first order polynomial in x. It's a first degree polynomial. In x. Okay. So just in case you're unaware of what this first degree polynomial means. Let me define it for you. So an nth degree polynomial in x is an equa is a function of the form something times x to the n plus something, so these are constants, these a's, times x to the n minus 1 plus something times x to the n minus 2 and all the way down to something times x and something. Okay, So it's a function which is made up only of powers of x added together and the highest power of x is n. So when we say the tangent line is a first degree polynomial, what we mean is it's made up of x to a certain power added together, and the highest power of x here is 1, right? Because it's just x times f prime of a plus some constant here. Okay. Now one of the uses of the tangent line is to give you an approximation to the function f of x. If you look in the vicinity of a here, there's some region where the tangent line is pretty close to the function. So in this region I can approximate the function by the tangent line. So close to x equals a, you have the f of x is approximately equal to the tangent line ta of x. Okay. And 
the way I'm going to motivate Taylor series is by trying to make this approximation better. Okay. So that one question you can ask is how to make a better approximation. So why is the tangent line a good approximation? Firstly, it's a good approximation because it has the same value of f at the point a. And the second thing that makes it a good approximation is it has the same derivative of f at the point a. If the derivative was different, if it was a line like this, you see this is a much worse approximation. right? So the fact it has the same first derivative and the same value is what makes the tangent line a good approximation. However, the second derivatives of the tangent line and the function f are different because the tangent line is a straight line and therefore its second derivative is zero. And in general, the second derivative of the function f of x will not be zero. So one way you can try to improve this approximation of the tangent line is to add something else here, which will mean that not only is the value of the function the same and the first derivative the same, but also make the second derivative the same. And if we do that, then we should be able to get a better approximation to the function f. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to try to find a second degree polynomial. It has to be at least second degree in order to get a non-zero second derivative. Okay, and we'll call this one TA2 of x, 2 to denote the fact it's second degree, such that, so we want the values of the functions to be the same, so you want, at the point A, sorry, so you want this to be true, you want the derivatives to be the same, and you also want the second derivatives to be the same. So the values of the function are the same, the values of the first derivative are the same, and the values of the second derivatives are the same. That's our goal. And you can find this function, so I'll, let me explain how to do that. If I set a new function, g of x, which I define as being equal to x minus a squared over 2, then you see that the value of this function at a is 0. So I just get a minus a. If I differentiate it, then you get 2 comes down and cancels this 2 here. So you just get x minus a. And the value of the derivative at a is also equal to 0. And if you differentiate one more time, you get 1. So the value of the second derivative at a is equal to 1. And obviously, higher derivatives are 0. So what you do is you add this function to the tangent line multiplied by the value of the second derivative of f. So we define ta2 of x, this is our second order poly, second degree polynomial which matches the second derivative of f at a. We define it as the tangent line and then plus the second derivative of f at the point a multiplied by this function g. So multiplied by x minus a squared over 2. Okay, and you see the reason you do that. This function here does not change the value of the function t at a, and it does not change the value of the first derivative of the function at a, but it does change the value of the second derivative. This one is equal to 1. So if I multiply it by f double prime, then the second derivative of this function is equal to the second derivative of f. So that's our solution. So this is a secondary polynomial because it's x squared, and it matches the value, the first derivative, and the second derivative of f at the point a. So you can ask what this function looks like. Um, so if I draw it on here, it will look something like this. So you know what quadratic equations look like, right? So you have a certain symmetry, you get a function which looks something like this in blue. Okay. 
Okay, so this is t a to x. And you see that, as I've drawn it here, this is a, a good approximation to the function f over a wider range of x. So this does improve the approximation of the tangent line by adding this second order term here. Okay, now you may have already thought that we can probably extend this idea to higher degree polynomials. In general, this function here, ta2, will have a zero third derivative, and therefore the third derivative of this function will not be the same as the third derivative of f in general, but maybe we can add a third degree term to make the third derivatives also equal, and then we'll get an even better approximation. So it turns out, yes, you can do that, and that the logic is the same. So um, if we define a new function, so let me call this h of x is equal to x minus a cubed over 3 factorial. So then, what do you get? You get that h of a is equal to 0 for that. If you work out the derivatives, then if I differentiate this, the 3 here cancels the 3 there. So I get x minus a squared over 2. So therefore, h prime at point a is 0. Differentiate again, I get x minus a. So the second derivative is 0. Differentiate again, I get 1. So the third derivative is equal to 1. So analogously to the way we use the function g for the second degree polynomial, we can use this function h to fix the value of the third derivative of a third degree polynomial. So therefore, we define a new function, t a 3 of x. So this is to show that it's a third order polynomial. And it's the same as what we had before. Right, so this is the second order polynomial we found, t a 2 of x. But we add on the third derivative, the third degree term, which is this, multiplied by the third derivative of the function f. Okay. So if we define this, then in exactly the same way as for the ta2 function, you find that the value of this function at a is equal to the value of f at a, the first derivative at a, is equal to the first derivative of the function at a, the second derivative at a is equal to the second derivative of the function at a, and the third derivative at a is equal to the third derivative of the function at a. Okay. So this, in principle, will be an even better approximation to the function f than the second degree polynomial. So hopefully you can now see how this generalizes. So finally, let me just write the general form down for this. OK, so in general, we define, so OK, let me start with this. If I define a function, I'm running out of letters now, h, i, um, OK, um, let me just call it g tilde of x which is x minus a to the power n over n factorial. So this is the same as I've defined here for h or g in the previous case, but for a general integer n. Then you can show that the nth derivative of this function is equal to 1 if m is equal to n. In other words, the nth derivative gives you 1. This is at the point a and it's 0 otherwise. So therefore, we can use this function to control the nth derivative of an nth order polynomial. Okay. So we define this nth order polynomial, so t a n of x as f of a plus f prime a times x minus a plus dot 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 plus all of this stuff. 
Um, so then we've got x minus a to the m minus 1 over m minus 1 factorial times the n minus 1th derivative of the function f at a. And the final term is x minus a to the n over n factorial times the nth derivative of f at a. Okay, so now it's neater to write this down in as a summation notation. So you can write this down as the sum of m goes from 0 to n of the x minus a to the power m over m factorial times the mth derivative of f at the point a. Okay, okay. and if you do that, then you can show that the nth derivative of this function at the point a is equal to the mth derivative of f at the point a for all values of m between 0 and n. In other words, the value and the first n derivatives of this polynomial are the same as the value and the first m derivatives of the function f. Okay. I should just say quickly here, in, I use this notation, so you're used to n factorial when n is a positive integer, but here the sum m goes from 0, so you also have 0 factorial in the first term. And just to note that by convention, or by definition if you prefer, we define 0 factorial to be equal to 1. Okay, that then that formula works even for this first term here. Okay. So that's a common definition. If you ever see 0 factorial, the value is defined as being 1. OK, so I want to show you how what these functions look like for a particular example, which is here. So what we've got here, the black line, is the function f of x, which is just e to the minus x squared. That's this black line here. And I've got a computer to plot some of these, these functions t, a, n, okay, which match certain orders of the derivatives of f. So this blue one here is t, a, 2 of x. That means this blue line has the first, same value, first derivative and second derivative of f at the point a, and the point a in this graph was here. So you see this is quite a good approximation to the function f over a range like this. This green one matches also the third derivative, so this is t a 3 of x. Okay, and you can see the approximation is slightly improved on this side and is actually made slightly worse on this side. This purple line here is the tenth function, t a 10. So in other words, the first 10 derivatives of this are the same as the first 10 derivatives of the function f of x. And you see now this is a much better approximation over what wider range of values of x. Okay, So we can increase the degree of the polynomial and as we do so we get a better and better approximation to the function f of x. Okay, So the Taylor series is just what happens to these, these functions as I take the degree of the polynomial to infinity. So now finally we are ready to define what a Taylor series is. The definition, the Taylor series of a function f of x at a point a is defined as, so I'll call it t a, big T this time, t a of x. This is the limit as the degree of the polynomial goes to infinity of the functions t a n of x. Okay, So I can write this down in the summation notation. This is the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of x minus a to the power n over n factorial times the nth derivative of f at the point a. Okay, So that's the definition of a Taylor series. Okay.
Okay, so you can take this, and for certain functions, it's easy enough to calculate the derivatives, so it's easy enough to work out what the Taylor series are. And I've chosen five basic series which are quite easy to work out and quite good to know. So here they are, these five. So the first one is the Taylor series of e to the x, and you see it's a if you cut it off at any n, then you get a polynomial of degree n. 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on. Okay. Next, cos and sine can also be written down as infinite Taylor series. And log of 1 plus x and 1 plus x to the power for a general power p here. So these are quite common Taylor series um, which are useful to know. So I would recommend that you learn these series. And the second video I'm going to do this week, I'm going to derive all these results for you and explain a bit more about them. Okay. So these are some basic Taylor series for functions which come up a lot of times in physics. However, you can use this definition to work out the Taylor series of, of any function, a general function. So a third video this week is going to show you how to do that. So it's going to show you if I take a general function, um, how do you work out the Taylor series? And there are basically two different ways of doing it. The first way is just to use this definition as it is. So you calculate the derivatives of the function f, evaluate at the point a, and sum them up like this. A second way you can do it is by combining the Taylor series of functions you already know. So for example, if I ask you to find the Taylor series of f of x is e to the x cos x, you could do it in this way by calculating the derivatives of this and applying this formula. But you could also do it by multiplying the Taylor series for e to the x with the Taylor series of cos of x. That's an alternative way to get this result. Okay, So I'm going to show some more examples like that in a third video this week. Okay, So just before we finish, there's one final question which I want to address. If you look at this graph I showed you, it looks like, as I increase the degree of the polynomial, the approximation to f gets better and better. So you can ask, in the Taylor series, in the limit that n goes to infinity, does that mean that the Taylor series is exactly equal to the function? Okay. So is the Taylor series to a of the function f of x at the point a equal to f of x? Okay. So for this function, f of x is e to the minus x squared, it turns out that the answer is yes. Okay? So for every point x here, the Taylor series is equal to the value of the function exactly. However, the answer unfortunately is not always s. Is not always yes, sorry. So I want to show you a couple of examples where the answer turns out to be no in general. So here's the first one. So this is the Taylor series of 1 over 1 plus x, around the point a equals 0. Okay, So this is the function f of x here. Um, this red line here is the second order. So this is ta2 of x, around the point 0. This blue line here, I think, was the sixth order. So this is ta6 of x. And finally, this green line here is the 20th order. So this is ta20 of x. So what you can see is that on this side, the green line is very good on this side of the line, right? It follows the black line. I don't, I don't know if you can resolve the green and the black. But the green line here follows the black line more or less exactly all the way up here. So on this side, it's a very good approximation. But you can see here, it, something goes very wrong. Right? The value of the function f of x is down here, but the green line is going up and up here. Now you can understand what's going on here if you work out the Taylor series of this function. So I'll just tell you what it is. t0 of x turns out to be 1 minus x plus x squared minus x cubed plus x to the 4 minus so on. So in other words, it's the sum n goes from 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n times x to the n. Okay, And you can see that this sum is only going to make sense if x has modulus less than 1. So this only converges for modulus of x 
less than 1. Right? Because, for example, if I take the case x equals 2, then I'll get 1 minus 2 plus 4 minus 6 plus... Sorry, <laughs> try again. 1 minus 2 plus 4 minus 8 plus 16 minus 32. The numbers just get bigger and bigger. It's not going to give you a sensible answer over here. Okay? So here, the Taylor series diverges. It doesn't give you a sensible answer. It only gives you a sensible answer if x is less than 1. Okay. So for this function, the Taylor series only gives you a sensible answer if the size of x is less than 1. Now you might be thinking there's a reason for this, and the reason is the fact that the function itself diverges when x is equal to minus 1, so therefore the Taylor series must also diverge when x is equal to minus 1. But it turns out it's not quite that simple, as I want to show in just a second example here. So this is a very similar function. This is the Taylor series of 1 over 1 plus x squared. And here it is, f of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared, this black line here. And again, if you work out the Taylor series around 0, this is 1 minus x squared plus x to the 4 minus x to the 6 plus x to the 8 and so on. And again, this only converges only converges if the magnitude of x is less than 1. Okay? So again, you can see here, this green line again is the TA20 of x. And you can see it only really gives you a sensible answer between the values minus 1 and 1. So again, the Taylor series only converges within this range of x. But different from the last case, this function, 1 over 1 plus x squared, is well defined everywhere. This function just goes to 0 at infinity. It's bounded between 0 and 1. There's nothing bad about this function um, for any value of x. So it's what I want to show is in this first example, it's not just the fact that the function diverges as x goes to minus 1, which causes the Taylor series to, to diverge. Even if the function is well defined everywhere, the Taylor series may still diverge. And this is something you have to be careful about. Right, so let me write the answer to this question then. Is the Taylor series equal to the function? So in general, unfortunately, the answer is no. So for each function f of x and point a, there is something known as a radius of convergence. Yeah, let's call it R. And it's this radius of convergence is such that if you are closer to, if the value of x is within R of A, then the Taylor series is equal to the function. So such that TA of x is equal to f of x for x minus a less than r, but the Taylor series TA of x will diverge if you are further away than this, so if x minus a is greater than r. So this is the general result. You can define a radius of convergence r such that if you're within this radius, the Taylor series is equal to the function. But if you're outside of this radius, then the Taylor series diverges. Okay. So we won't prove this. In a few weeks when we talk about complex numbers, I'll give you a quite simple way of finding the radius of convergence r for a general function. For now, let me just annotate this, this table here and tell you the radius of convergence of each of these five basic series. of convergence. So the first three are good. The first three, the radius of convergence is infinity. That means that the Taylor series is equal to the function everywhere. So here, here, and here, the Taylor series is always equal to the function. But for these last two, the Taylor series 
only converges if you are within distance 1 of 0. In other words, if x is between minus 1 and 1. Okay. Right. So that's the results for these functions. Um, I'm going to put a link below the video for you to a sheet like this if you want to print out your own copy of this sheet. So you can find that in the description below the video. As I said, it's a good idea to learn these. And there's a couple more videos this week which look at, first of all, proving that these results are true. And secondly, how do you calculate the Taylor series of a general function as well? Right, so that's it for this introductory video. And I hope you find the other videos useful too.